So let's go into the interactive dialogue as Dr. Harris plus record. So um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Steve Chasman. Uh, as a broken tackle, I'll invite you to jump in on the tail end and fill in some of the points, but I think I'm preaching to the group. So has been in Nassau and Suffolk County since 1956. This is not about us, this is about all of us. Um, but our work has never been more important, much like yours. The world seems to be changing daily. And we have a great partnership with Dr. Harris and Glen Cove State. And every district is important. But let me tell you that Dr. Harris and all of you people do more than most. Uh, we have a great relationship with um, Mr. Bruce Kennedy, who we know very well, who's driving force with us as well. And just hearing all of you, I know Adam is uh, in the Glen Cove School District with his team, as well as 109 other schools on the line. So let me just be brief. Um, two weeks ago, we took a couple of carloads full of families to Washington, D.C., which was a national fentanyl crisis. Um, I'm in the field of 30 years. We were talking about starting our, with my hospital friend in HIV and AIDS, right back in the old days. And uh, I've, I've seen uh, quite a few public health crises. HIV and AIDS, uh, of course, COVID, and a 15-year head start of an opioid crisis. Uh, today's focus is on marijuana and THC products, but let me tell you, all of this plays an active role. Uh, I was in D.C. with mothers and fathers and grandparents and sisters and brothers, and you've never seen anything more disturbing than 10,000 tombstones on the Capitol lawn and pictures of 50,000 children under 35 who will forever be 22, forever be 27. So this went in all crisis, and to our friends in law enforcement, thank you. I heard you say you're on the front lines of prosecutions and arrests around fentanyl. Fentanyl is real. It's a real crisis. Um, Adam knows this, but there was a young man I was helping who fought with Lycad in and out of treatments for 10 years and lost his battle um, three weeks ago. Now, I don't get to make this call. His mother was part of our support group. We just hang, hung his name on our legacy tree. But I believe if young people fight for their mental health, for their mental health for 10 years, um, if I had my way, you have a right to, to win. You're, you're safe. You're sad. Uh, uh, your restoration to physical, psychological, academic, vocational, fine. So one time, one fell can kill. You know, in two weeks, we'll be at the DEA's family summit. Uh, like is an active participant with our Drug Enforcement Administration. We've done fentanyl pools around here. Uh, by the way, you all have the PowerPoint. Um, you can take that home. I'm, I guess, infamous for going off script a little, but um, I want to commend all of you for doing the work you're doing and changing all of us. You know, I, I think we all know this, so you wouldn't be on the coalition. There's a great um, misnomer that, um, that we think we're more organized than we are. And we always think that someone else's responsibility to make things better, if nothing else in the city of Glen Cove. And you wouldn't have joined this coalition if you didn't believe that I'm going to foster the change that I want to see, right? First of all, if I'm not looking at it, I see various ages here. I'm sliding into 54 myself. I grew up in Nassau County on the South Shore. I'm a product of the public school system. I'm not saying anyone here, but if you use my honor in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, this ain't that. I'll ask Adam Birkenstock to challenge my data regarding my cat for a 67 year old organization. If, if the data is skewed or whatnot, let me tell you the facts then. I'm not saying that every young person that uses marijuana products will progress to cocaine or opioids or other substances, okay? But I am telling you that people that come into our office with serious and profound issues, poly, multiple substance use, all right? Marijuana plays a role in 90% or THC products. So I know there's still great debate. Is this a gateway drug? The reality is it is for some based on family history, genetic predisposition, and the status of all of our collective mental health. Remember, uh, we had a friend of a almost a couple of weeks ago. She's working to the, uh, we stood next to her mid-summer, and we're an apolitical organization. But this fentanyl substance use crisis, of which marijuana plays an uh, intricate role, all right, um, is a national security issue. I'll say it again, it's a national security issue. There's a whole generation of young men and women who are not just dying of fatal poisonings or overdoses. There's also a whole generation of young men and women who are being inundated with self-medications at a rate we've never before seen, all right? Organic history, all right? 
we fought and we spoke loudly against the previous governor. Remember when the legalization of marijuana was? It was in April of 2020, smack dab in the middle of a global pandemic. You couldn't go to school, you couldn't go to church, you couldn't go to temple, but you could go to the liquor store and then they legalized marijuana. At the height of when we were all dealing with isolation, loneliness, financial insecurity, uh, and levels of fear and anxiety, not to mention a collective grief and loss. I'm not going to quantify human loss, but we lost a million people to COVID-19, actually. All right? I'm not going to say we're out of that public health crisis because the mental health implications are still there. All right? Let me also say that according to the Centers for Disease Control, 2022, not Steve Chazzy, but the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, for as long as we've been keeping records, Okay. Um, 2022 was the most tragic year in American history. 110,000 people died of opioid related overdose or poison. Now, why do we say poison? Listen, if I get bacon and eggs and I end up on a gurney, that's food poison. If I'm buying a Xanax for a friend for relief from my fear of anxiety and I die of fentanyl, that's not an overdose. That's not what I bought into. All right. When I'm you buying cocaine, we don't have to use the use of any of these drugs. We had a real license two summers ago. Right? Remember those six college students who were attending bar and waiting tables in Greenport? Bought some cocaine to go dancing and all the streets died of fentanyl poisons. So 2022, 110,000. Any sports fans here? How many people does John Stadium? How many? I don't know. 86,000? So 110,000 opioid related in a 12 month period. Now you have to times that by three or four. Why? It's a family illness. Believe me, we work with families who support a treatment and gave those giving trait. This is a family disease. We know people in the struggle right now, right? It's not just about their children and their mothers or fathers. This is a family illness. And by the way, a lot of light on the fentanyl crisis. You know, last year, same 12 months. You know what the most lethal drug in America is last year and every year? You said it before. Alcohol. Alcohol killed 156,000 Americans last year alone, 12 month period. So we're not going to get into legal or illegal. We're public health experts. We knew with the legalization and commercialization, and those are the two separate things, right? Legalization, and Mike has been a great advocate. I'm not going to say this out loud, and Bruce knows as well. No one cares about substance users on the line like Lycan does. You can probably say that about Sing too. We've been looking out for their dignity, their respect, their well-being, the advocacy for quality and evidence-based treatment for 67 years. We really care about substance users and their families. So we don't think people who use marijuana products belong in jail. That's a separate conversation and how that played out on the uh, the Latino, the African American. We work with the Native American tribes in Shinnecock too. Um, how that played out on um, underserved communities was devastating. We knew from a public health crisis, all right, coming out of whatever we're coming out of with COVID-19, that the legalization and commercialization from, that, from a public health standpoint was going to be important. So a federal center asked me a couple of weeks ago, Steve, why are you? Senator, they anesthetize pain. They anesthetize all drugs, anesthetize pain. Not just physical pain, but emotional pain. I'm not a politician, but Sharon and I are colleagues and friends, and we had a moment there, and I think all of us are feeling as we keep our eyes on the Middle East over the last 72 hours, as we watch through our phones or through any kind of media what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, the world is changing size. Young people are tuned in to these devices. They're being inundated with images like you and I are, right? So what kind of pain can human beings be in? What kind of pain? Give me one. Emotion. What kind of emotional pain? Socratic discourse. Depressive. Huh? Depressive. Looking at the world as I can't, I won't, I'll never. What is the officer? What is some other kind of pain that you see on the phone? People have anxiety like never before. And what is the emotion behind anxiety? Fear. How many people in this room? I know we're coming live. How many people in this room? And we're the parents. 
So Adam and I will play too. How many people in this room would say in the last 90 days they've been under significant amount of stress? If you don't have your hand up, I'd like to talk to you and help you. Okay. By the way, it's about 100% of the room. So what do we talk about the legalization of marijuana as a minor mood altering substances where the THC levels have been hydroponically and genetically enhanced as a very potent psychoactive chemical? I think not by the nature's marijuana. And this is what, and this is a bunch of hippies in Colorado with hair just about my length, uh, and tied and tied guys saying, hey, let's legalize marijuana, man. You're talking about a billion dollar industry and the commercialization is coming straight at our kids and your students. Because they're not targeting the billion dollar industry, the 54 year olds that want to keep a couple of ounces in the freezer next to the hot house and watch Seinfeld on the weekends and just hang out. They're taking a page from the tobacco companies. If they can get them at 14 and 15, they got them for the next 30 years. And in the best case scenario, now, as yourselves, if you know families like this, and there's no judgment, it's a byproduct of chronic marijuana use, or what we call substance or cannabis use disorder, a motivational syndrome. Now, you talk to Adam, Adam's my dad guy, right? I mean, he's really, he's tuned in to dad. You know, I'm more experiential, so it's it's a nice yin and yang. But the data is in for the first states that legalize marijuana. California, Nevada, we know about underachievement academic. We know about short-term memory loss. We know about uh, underperformance vocation. We know about car accidents and levels of car insurance that have gone up exponentially. The data is in, but we're not following it. So, and listen, when we talk about the commercialization, it is an onslaught of self-medication. So when we talk about fear, when we talk about anxiety, when we talk about depression, when we talk about financial insecurity or families dealing with, and I'm not a politician, uh, affordable housing. Affordable housing on the left, right? Uh, and let alone, listen, Tumblr just broke out in the Middle East. What's that going to do for gas prices and heating oil? I don't even thought about it. You might be like, why did this half empty? You know, what was a thousand dollars could be twice as much as that if we've learned anything throughout history. But when we talk about, listen, I'm afraid that I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm really sad growing up in Belmore, where my first concert at 12 was seeing Billy Joel, resident, local resident, at the Nassau Coliseum, where I saw so many artists and musicians. It'd be a casino, where they're going to be serving alcohol 24 hours a day, where there's going to be the sale of illicit and illicit substances without clocks on the wall, right across from Kellenberg High School and Father Philip Eichner, served down the board for 30 years until his inevitable passing, where Hofstra is not next door, where just in the backside of the Coliseum is Nassau Community College, where a lot of us took credits to forward our advancement. Now, yes, they can gamble, not to mention gambling, another obsession of culture. These are really challenging times. So when you're moving to change laws in your little city of Glenco, you don't think so, but you are leaders in New York State right now. I'm not a politician, and we don't take a lot of state funds. Some, but not a lot. Our board wants it that way, because we don't like the government telling us to pay for the rights of our substance users that we work with and our citizens. The Office of Cannabis Management in New York State fumbled this in a major way. I don't know if anyone's been in New York City. I was on a train at 7.30 in the morning of Brockton, Penn Station. As soon as I got up, there was the wave of marijuana. This was on a Tuesday. That means that most of those people who were engaging in THC or marijuana products, young or old, were either going to school as, as teachers or students. They were showing up in a workplace, right? They were operating heavy machinery. But it's 8 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. And as many of us have pointed out, Listen, alcohol is legal if you're over 21, but you can't walk down Broadway with a bottle of Jack Daniels in your mind. You're going to be summoned, officer. You're going to be arrested for an open container. And if it's public intoxication, there are other issues. So this is a free-for-all. And if we're not going to look after our young people, we're not giving up on this generation. But they are in and out of the site. Jails, institutions, and death. Adam and the team, and Marcy Siciano, our clinical director, we just got some opioid monies. We've been in the Nassau and Suffolk County jails for a decade. 
And we know those men and women, the adolescent, male, female tears, the DWR, green or orange jumpsuits, depending on which county you're in. So really good people they do get their choices under the influence. And marijuana plays a role in 90% of their stores. These are really challenging times, I think, because I'm a fan of history. History is prologue, right? right? History is prologue. We have to learn from our mistakes. Jails have never been more full. You know who the greatest housing provider is in Nassau and Suffolk County for substance users right now? In Nassau and Suffolk County jail. Still, or for untreated other psychiatric conditions. Other. Now, Adam, myself, Dr. Harris, we're mental health professionals. Right? Dr. Harris has the highest credentials in the, in the room. But we abide by what's called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. We're in the fifth edition. It's put out by the American Psychiatric Association. Depression and mood disorders is in there. Psychotic and other uh, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders are in there. And in between those two, there is a chapter called Substance-Related Disorders. They all have codes, diagnostic codes. Cocaine use and abuse and dependence is in there. Opioid use, abuse, alcohol use, abuse, and dependence. You know what's also in there? Cannabis use, abuse, and dependence. It has a code. Young people ask me all the time, well, how do you know? Like, you know, recreation, I listen to the difference between these two states. They sound very similar. Remember, most of us are in this group just dealing with stress and anxiety. And I'm not saying anyone here. Listen to the difference. At the end of the week, after a really stressful week, if I just smoke some weed, I can chill out and relax. At the end of the week, I can't achieve some level of relaxation without my Those sound really similar. And they become habituated. We know that the incidence, the prevalence, the onset of substance use disorder is higher than it's been ever before. That means that more people are turning to synthetic coping strategies than ever before. People do it with food. Nathan was great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, people do it with gambling. And we know these devices. Listen, can we? I don't, someone sold my data. DraftKings is sending me texts. I don't gamble. That means someone sold my gap. And they're saying you can gamble here on college or pro football. And if you rest the shoulder, then young people are getting the same tests. We're in the middle of the commercialization of marijuana, and I commend this group, this coalition, for changing laws in your little city. Uh, we have a relationship with both commissioners of police, as, as I'm sure you do. Commissioner Ryder will tell you, all right? These big shops across Long Island. It's a ticket. They're selling marijuana and THC products out of them. They're basically saying to law enforcement, come get them. If you've been in New York City, they have big bags. Formerly, they look like ice cream trucks. They're selling dime bags, Lucy's of marijuana, high potent marijuana and THC products, right at lunchtime, right next to the sandwiches. It is a free for all. Now, it makes no difference to me, but from a public health standpoint, it's going to be a nightmare. The mental health crisis is real. We were just in DC. We're coming off the single most tragic year in American history of substance related fatalities across the poor. Young people ask me all the time, how many people you know overdose on marijuana? Zero. But I know that when I drive across this island, there's a lot of flowers and a lot of crosses in our trees. Have you noticed those? Yes. The Watton and Southern City. Yeah. Have we bothered, and I posed this question to both county and Jack, have we bothered to ask, let alone those of us driving off the road with these things, because marijuana plays a role in antibodies. Certainly alcohol, certainly opioids. We had some real hard lessons the last couple of weeks. Right by where I live, my wife and I live in Northport, Lawrence Hill Road. And a young man went to my house in high school, under the influence, killing a couple. 12 o'clock at night on the South Shore that same weekend, killing a family of three opioids, alcohol, marijuana. I mean, I'm not here to be one dimensional about this, but this is our plague. This is our generational plague. I'm not going to quantify human laws. We started our work in HIV and AIDS, New York City. I mean, I like everyone's eye on me. That's right. I actually, that's the best part, anyway, then. Because you were in the you were in the struggle to make it better. All right. I'm not going to quantify human loss. We've blown past the death toll 
an HIV and AIDS years ago about substance use disorders. You take 110,000, 156,000, not to mention cocaine or other substance related things, finally a disease that kills 300,000 Americans here at the year, every year. Filling giant stadiums two and three times over. It's a shame we've done so little so far. We learned a hard lesson just coming out of it. We did, and black cats are beneficiaries, but the families aren't. The Sackler family and other pharmaceutical companies have settled for billions of dollars. We were very fortunate to get the first round of opioid funds in NASA and Suffolk. We are applying for round two. We have great relationships, but you know what? The loss is already the loss. That is blood money. But you know what the lesson is? These are U.S. pharmaceutical companies that were pushing Food and Drug Administration, FDA-approved medications, knowing flooding our markets. Here's the lesson we learned with marijuana. When you pit monetary gain against public health, public health is losing royal. No, 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 that's not a political statement. That's a public health statement. Someone's making billions on the public or individual health of our kids, our families, our communities. Now, I know Bruce and I know Shannon, um, and I know some of you through the years. You are leaders in the community. Like that, we want to be leaders. We don't see things as right and wrong all the time. We see things on the track of healthy or unhealthy. Now, I know, Karen and this, uh, I know Sharon and this coalition have worked hard to get evidence and best practice prevention programs in the school. You know, listen, I'm not going to get into like how fentanyl gets in. We've worked with the DA. We founded their first family summer. We'll be there at John Jay College in two weeks. Like that is actually getting uh, recognition from the Drug Enforcement Administration. Listen, well, 20 years ago, we stayed away from law enforcement, respectfully, because they were still incarcerating our clients. They don't know. We know the sensitivity training. We know the DA is not going to, and local law enforcement, is not going to incarcerate the way out of this issue. This is a psychiatric issue. It's an untreated substance use, cannabis use, opioid, alcohol use disorder. And we need to change the whole paradigm. Someone running down on Veterans Highway or Sunrise Highway, uh, or Glen Cove Road at three in the morning to sell stolen laptop computers or jewelry for their drug of choice is not to her his or her right state of mind. They're in an obsession and compulsion. And you know what? I think a lot of us learned this during the shutdown of COVID. When human beings are in great periods of depression or fear or anxiety, we look for relief. Relief. You know why? Because we're human beings and we're all found. Substance use disorder, it's still the same. Someone with shorter hair came to John F. Kennedy or Grand Avenue Junior High School in the 70s and 80s and said virtually the same thing. Adam and I stay and his team to 30,000 students a year. There were three gateway drugs. Alcohol, still the most deadly drug in America. Right? Nicotine. We did really well. You pointed out. I mean, listen, do you remember when you could smoke in high school? But yeah. my, my sister, who's 16, lives in Great Neck. If you were 18, you could smoke in the courtyards of high school. I mean, I in high school. And the majority of the parents are so look how far we've come. We did really well with adolescent smoke. It declined radically with local laws and state laws and federal bans and the whole thing. And then the vaporization in 18. By the way, on a school based professional, you see a lot of these students dealing with anxiety? Yes. Anxiety. They're afraid to come to school. School refusal because of anxiety. Now, I'm not saying every student, but you know, what is the active drug in vape or tobacco? Nicotine is what type of drug? It's a stimulant. You look at the stimulant drug? Cocaine, amphetamine. Caffeine, my drug of choice. They increase heart rate, they increase thoughts per minute. If people are struggling with anxiety, the last thing they should have is a stimulant because it increases their anxiety, right? So little things that they don't know, but this is why our educational programs and Glen Cove Safe is so important to get this education out there. Yes, sir. It's going to say because once the drug is derived from the and that's what you get. It's training. It's a that's right. 
and no one seems to be acknowledging the issue of the social media and that it's no one that will carry on. That's right. That's right. Now, listen, uh, I think 15 years ago, we were on the front end of doing, uh, I know Bruce remembers Lisa Gans, uh, Adam's predecessor. We were the first to talk about digital mental health among the technological age. Like, these aren't going I think the two things have come to the point where, um, whether it's bullying, and I saw that on your agenda and some of the school based stuff. I mean, listen, in the old days, if you were bullied from seven to three, it ended at three. Now it could go on 24 hours a day. I mean, listen, we see this with love. One of the things I think was just seven to three, correct. And it ended at the end of the day, either way, or eight. Or eight. Or eight. Or eight. And then it's just kind of and then it's just kind of like, yeah, 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 I'm going to a metaphor for our cognitive state. If we don't power down, if we don't learn healthy coping strategies, like exercise and market. So I saw art was a big part of that. Self-expression is really, really important. Athletics, exercise, and to be part of something. Listen, no disrespect, but if I got the weed, you got the apparatus, and you got the ladder, there's something we can do together. It's a belonging thing. Remember the first word of the cognitive, we all want to be the weed. Right? We all want to be part of school. But um, we need to incorporate, um, I hate the word, but maybe indoctrinate young people to let them know this is their plague. This is their um, generational plague. It is destroying not just intellectually, but physically, psychologically, vocational, interpersonal. You know, I'll tell you this, with all the fine people, and I say fine, because they're good people that are incarcerated, that we work with. And this is how we know it's a disease, because they rub their heads, and they're like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I sold my most jewels. I can't believe I drove that car on that hurt people. You know, when you take mind and mood altering drugs, including THC and marijuana products, which are more potent now than ever before, your mind and your mood get impacted. We know, and Adam's been filling the data with this, um, you know, National Institute of Drug Abuse. Age of first use, 12, 13, 14. We were saying, like someone just said, in eighth grade, they're already exposed to stuff. We know that the incidence of a formal psychiatric diagnosis called substance use disorder, the earlier the experimental substance use, the greater habituated that they assign a pill or powder or bud or lotion to those feelings, fear, sadness, happiness, joy, socialization. By the time they hit high school, the thought of socializing without alcohol for a lot of people is totally foreign to them. The thought of watching a football game and not pregame. The thought of going and watching a, a Star Wars or any other movie without indulging in THC products. And by the way, if you know people that use marijuana in your personal lives, ask if you don't think it has a dependence. Ask them to do any number of just simple pleasures without the use of marijuana. It becomes habituated. And if nothing else, and we hear this from parents across the island, he's 35 years old. He's still in my basement playing PlayStation. I yes, I'll say this with love. I have a friend I grew up. I mean, you know, an athlete, academic. You started using marijuana in high school. I, I, I'm not, maybe I am, but I don't need to judge, but he could have done anything. But he's still a heavy marijuana user. And something about his life didn't materialize. Not a bad guy. Any motivational syndrome. Marijuana has the ability in THC products to hijack the development, pursue, and the achievement of your goals. There's an old saying, if you're not working on something, something's working on you. And marijuana tends to steal the focus and the attention. Some people will tell you different. Now, granted, people do have that first childhood experiences. People do have stressors and level of anxieties we've never before tracked. But we have to teach them about exercise. We have to teach them about self-communication uh, uh, and wellness plans. You know, you work with young people all day, right? So whatever. 
how we are, you know, how you are, give them the language to describe their emotions. Share a problem, come in here. There would be no field of psychology or social work without communication. I know now, and we know now, because we're a clinical team and we do supervision, we support each other. We're doing, Dr. Harris too, and all of you, we're, we're on the front lines of something really, really difficult right now. And we support each other. You're supporting your community. Keep changing laws. Keep pushing evidence-based prevention laws. Keep speaking out against the commercialization and monetization of detriment to our generation. If you have passion in my voice, I mean, Today's the anniversary of the law sheet. One of our clinicians did a great job with the other woman. And despite all the great support she was getting from her family, like that, that she was to fight for the sweater. So this isn't just an overdose of poisoning. This is self image, this is self esteem. This is that depression or nihilism that I can't, I won't go now. I'm sure every generation could say, well, we don't have a chance. But you know, we have a bird's eye view of challenges across the globe. They're weighing on our mental health. This mental health crisis is real. And that includes substance use, that includes cannabis use disorder. What are we willing to do about it? That's probably the time for me to shut up a lot. No, but you might not have more. That's okay. Anyway, if you still hear a sense of urgency in our voice, I mean, we're in D.C. We just came off um, Overdose Awareness Day, which was in August, and then National Recovery Month, which was September. We know a lot of people are in the struggle. We also know that with proper support, with proper prevention education, with proper family dialogue and access to treatment on demand, that people get better. There's 30 million people living in long-term recovery from substance use and other mental health disorders right now, right here. In America, on the line. So your coalition is probably more important now than it ever was. I think you have one of the best leaders on Long Island, the Dr. Shadow Harris. I really do. I mean, yeah, get ready. Because I get texts from Shadow like, hey, we should do this. And like nine o'clock at night. Now the, the second thing is I'm thinking we should do something about that too, but she's already out there. You know? Judy Vining and Long Beach are our partner in, in, in progress. You know, I know a lot of you, particularly the school-based professionals that wake up early in the morning. And, you know, I'm the son of two teachers, you know? I mean, some of the most important jobs in America right now. And I say that about mental health and substance use professionals, some of the most important jobs in America right now. And you know who really has the onus of the most important jobs? Citizens. Because I'll say this, and I know we have representatives of local government here, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, thank you for being here. Um, there's great leadership, pockets of great leadership. But one of the, the fallacies in America is, oh, someone else will do it. Someone else doesn't always do it. Right? We learned that from HIV and AIDS. Communities need to step forward. They need to lead. I know that working with Adam, and of what a great partner I have in Adam Birkenstock, right? Um, Always is caught up to life. I'm going to say that. The Office of Alcohol and Substance Use Services caught up to life that. But 13 years ago, we got trained in New York City and it was intramuscular injections of naloxone. And we said, we're well, bring those back to Long Island and start handing them out. We saw the opioid crisis. And local law enforcement, and probably weren't in the fourth, I don't think Brian it was either, but local law enforcement said, you're putting needles in the hands of oak. We're trying to save lives. Up to 13 years later, every law that you carry naloxone, every EMT carries naloxone, families are carrying naloxone. Out of the team, hands out 20,000 kids a year. And last year in Long Island, despite an incredible pet poisoning and fatality rate, there were 1,500 lives, which is probably a kind estimate, by EMTs and first responders and law enforcement. 1,500 lives that were saved by naloxone. Now, we wish we weren't just in harm reduction, life preservation mode. We gotta get people on the road to a recovery. Some semblance. Well, now, what is recovery? Oh, the long hair social work we talked about with COVID. You know what recovery is? Not recovery, just your semblance of order, your physical, mental, psychological, your family, your interpersonal well being, your financial health, your housing, 
your ability to navigate all the emotional spectrums of mad, glad, scared, and sad without the use of TNP or powders or potions or pills. Now, let me say this. ADD is very real. Depression is very real. Pharmaceuticals, it's the best time in the history of the world to have a psychiatric condition. Pharmaceuticals have come a long way. And we refer to psychiatrists when it's appropriate. We're not doctors. But remember, we learned a hard lesson with pharmaceuticals. You know, sometimes they, they advertise medications to get off medications for medications. So um, I think with an exercise, I think we've got to remind young people this is the greatest reducer of stress out there. Exercise, um, self-expression. I know we don't have this problem in Glen Cove, but in certain underserved communities, the first thing to go are athletic programs and art and music programs. Why? People need to express themselves. Right? Now I'm just getting off top. In the interest of it, I'll make jobs. So, um, listen, keep fighting the fight. Um, you should know that LICAD has a sort of stop program that we work with Glencoe. Instead, and this is an Adam Birkenstock conception, he said, Hey, he said to a superintendent, Hey, if they're using vape or THC products in school, instead of just giving them attention, let's go and educate them. Why are we attention about um, nicotine and marijuana THC products? And that is taken hold. The Start to Stop program is three to five sessions of education, moving them along the continuum of change. So rather than just be disciplinary, let's make it psychoeducation. So we're all learning as we go along. Also know that um, we'll be doing compassion TV degree from loss counseling at LODCAD. Please go on our website. Um, we have a whole bunch of new programs um, based on as a criminal, it's usually the messenger. So well, either that or he's sending me the message it's time to stop. Yeah, it's fine. But there's a lot going on. We make no mistake about that. It's part of simple. It's kind of the We are our colleagues in the fight. And I think all of you, you know, 10 years from now, I'm just really grateful that the major community is taking her. And uh, with that, we have to buy cash. Uh, please ask me questions in the minutes we have remaining, and if I don't have the answer, I can almost assure you Adam Birkenstock does. Thank you for your time. You you know, so much on so many points, and so very much on the point you are. Um, my daughter's a junior at Sony Court, we're not state, and free gaming is big. Yeah. I don't really feel a pre gaming of like tailgate party, you know, before an event, but it's before they go back every time. So, let's just talk about that. I'm drinking before I go out drinking more. Um, the pre gaming lessens the drinking at the whatever destination, house sporting or bar. You know, that's not the same money. You know, it's 14 or 16 a cocktail, so they took the same money by doing it. The uh, not that I'm proud of any of it, but I think it lessens any roofing once they go out. So, like, that it's kind of a controlled thing. But, um, and then also, you know, on the mental health, you know, you live in this bubble for a while. So, your kids get older thinking, oh, everybody's happy, everybody's fine. Um, every one of our friends is in therapy, every one of them are on meds. And you know, yesterday was World Mental Health Day, and like I say, you, you you just you know you don't realize it, so, so you really see it up close. And, and so I say that's a good thing, though, right? That her friends are a openly talking about their mental health, and B they have to be sought out support. I mean, when we get out, it's not so. I'm in therapy. What's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, so and it, it's becoming more instead of it being like. It's, yeah. You know, it's it's becoming more uh, respected and understood. And and one of them, like you say, they turn to nicotine in the vape. And uh, so I said to my daughter, how are they thinking they're gonna calm down with that? You know, being that it's a stimulant, it's ridiculous, yes. you know. And the other thing, if people are on uh, mood stabilizers or SSRIs, the like serotonin B up inhibitors, antidepressants. If they're drinking alcohol, it's in the present. So we have to educate our clients. If you're taking an antidepressant that's trying to let them know the dopamine and serotonin, if you ingest the depressant that it's dopamine and serotonin, 
You're going to exacerbate your condition. Who's supposed to know that unless you explain that to them? Yeah. So, um, and listen, um, I, Sharon is the doctor, but we're not psychiatrists. But remember, I, I think sometimes we overshoot the mark. We're very quick to pharmaceuticals. Um, sometimes, you know, there are reactive depressions. Um, there are situations where we need to navigate stress and anxiety is not a bad thing. Most of us would have never gotten through high school or graduate programs without a healthy health and anxiety. Uh, I think anxiety is probably a driving force behind this coalition, right? To drive change, fear. So, excellent point. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. No, no one. Sorry. Let me give us some. Amazing information, but the support of knowing what we're doing with this in the right direction is really, really important. Well, we consider an honor and a privilege whenever Dr. Harris calls. Um, what we will always respond. It is a great partnership, and we thank you very much for that. For all the work you all are doing as we embark on fall, and it feels like October out there as we wait to Connecticut. Uh, here come the holidays, folks, and uh, let's stay close to your support. Thank you very much. And one more thank you, Mr. You know, to Sharon. I work closely with them in this strategic planning, but all of this that happens in there is that total world coordination. You are all in this room. Thank you.